The southern edge of California has some beautiful country, mountains, cacti, and amazing weather. While visiting Southwest California, we decided to make the most of our time and first visit the wall between San Diego and Tijuana. To my surprise, there was almost nobody in the parking lot and even less people on the beach. Those that were there were primarily riding horses, but regardless, the border security is heavy. Come to find out that the water is contaminated with sewage, so people aren't supposed to swim, and the beach is really more of a point of interest for this documentary as opposed to a tourist destination. In 2014, San Diego was estimated to have 170,000 illegal immigrants, and the Los Angeles, Long Beach, Anaheim area, which is between 100 and 120 miles north of San Diego was estimated to have 1 million. On the border wall, people in Tijuana had previously stolen razor wire from it to use for their own homes because it works so well. This particular sector of the border continues to be a hotspot for migrant caravans and Tijuana cartel operations. But as I said, Border Patrol was carefully watching over the area. This was just a detour from our meeting with a man who lives on the border and has stared the cartel down on more than one occasion. It's nice to meet you. Bob Maupin is a well-trained and well-armed man who lives on the border just east of San Diego. One of the unique aspects of Bob's property is the wall that he built himself after finding the U.S. government's wall to be inadequate. Shortly after arriving, we were already heading to his truck to go see it. The traffic that comes through his property was more comprehensible when he informed me that the people across the road from him are smugglers and thieves. It's why he has cameras and sensors all over his property. He drove me right up to the fence that he built, and unfortunately it was in need of repairing. But then he asked if I had heard of El Chapo Guzman. Okay, you see that big place? Way off there to the left, that's El Hongo. That is the maximum security prison that he escaped from. And the army was just here and put all that Constantino wire up on top of that. that that's that landing mat that they got stored here. Bob learned to ride horseback riding with Department of Agriculture agents along the border. They were looking for anything with a split hoof or a hoof and mouth disease. Some of the cartels that come through his property include the Ariano Felix Cartel, also known as the Tijuana Cartel, the Sinaloa Cartel, the Muslim Brotherhood, and MS-13. A uh, friend of mine who was a uh, gunny in the Corps, he called me up and he says, I want to make you a deal. And I said, yeah. He says, there's five guys who just got out of the Corps and the VA is trying to convince them that they're PTSD. They're not. But under Obama, if they're PTSD, then they have to turn in their weapons. They, they cannot own a firearm. So. But Obama was deathly afraid of anybody that was in the military. So that was one way of trying to uh, disarm all of them. So he said, if, if these guys can come out, camp on your place, you know, we'll come out and camp and, and let them do stuff, use your rifle range, and anything you need done around the ranch, hey, we'll do it for you. 
and now there's over 50 of them from all over Southern California. During Operation Gatekeeper, migrants were running into San Diego and actually running up the wrong way on the freeways. So they moved a lot of agents to the area, but they weren't paying much attention to what was going on farther east. So Bob used to pick up anywhere from 20 to 100 illegal migrants per night. Operation Gatekeeper was similar to Operation Hold the Line that I mentioned earlier in El Paso. Seeing as Bob's property is east of San Diego, it only makes sense that traffic was diverted to his area when routes were cut off further west. After driving around with Bob, we went into his house and got the chance to have a discussion with him about some of his experiences on the property. There was a building down in Mexico that had blue windows, for what reason I don't know. Uh, and every now and then, they'd fly the Mexican flag, and there were all kinds of brand new vehicles around there, and there were people walking the perimeter uh, with military-style weapons, and you may, with government permission, you may own a 22 or you may own a shotgun. And uh, we were hearing automatic weapon fire down there a lot. Anyway, one day my wife and I are out here, before the old barn collapsed and the breeze is always from the southwest and we smelled something that smelled like a, uh, a doctor's office. Well, finally dawned on us, ether. So I called a friend of mine who was, had been an undercover narcotics agent and told him about it and he said, my God, if you can smell it at your house, they're making meth by the boatload. So he says, stay by your telephone, I'm going to have a DEA guy call you. So the DEA called out of Los Angeles and we got together on a Thomas Brother map, showed him where I was and showed him where the math lab was. <clears throat> and I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to give it to my counterparts in Mexico and they'll go close it down. The following weekend, my daughter decides to go shooting down there where the shooting range is. And my son calls up and he says, I'm going to come up and do some target practice. Okay, I go down there because my daughter never stops shooting until dad runs out of ammo. Anyway, uh, we go down there and we're surrounded by the Mexican army and they disarmed us. And we conned them into coming up to the house. My daughter, we came through the brush and I told my daughter when we got around by the old corral uh, to head for the house, regardless of what happens back here, you head to the house and call the border patrol. So she did. And uh, we were more or less held hostage for four hours, and then the Border Patrol showed up and arrested them. And that was the start of our fun out here. The cartels used to uh, stage down south cut the, the uh, barbed wire fence and drive through with four or five truckloads of, of drugs at a time. And so one day I, they were staging down there and the border patrol was here and some of the guys that the Border Patrol called Moppin's Marauders were here with me, and they all went down towards the border, and I sat in that old green pickup truck with a Browning 1919 and a box of belted armor-piercing ammunition down here in the middle of the road. We had an east wind that day and a new Border Patrol agent came down from the west and they got him on a radio and said, get off the road, turn into Moppin's Gate and go up to the house and we'll let you know what's going on. So he comes in the big where, the gate where we went down there, the big black gate. He came in there, drove up the road and there's a spotter by this tower. 
just south of my house. He's got a radio and he's got binoculars. And this agent saw him and of course he didn't hear the car because the wind is blowing into the guy's face and the car is behind him. So he goes up and grabs the guy and got on the radio and says, hey, I got the spotter. And he said, well, you just killed the deal because without the spotter, they're not coming across. So they, he comes down the road where we went down and, and went south. He was coming north, came around, and pulls up alongside me, and he says, what on earth are you doing? And I said, well, when the trucks come up, I'm going to take the engines out, and I'm going to go through the windshields, and I'm going to kill every one of them guys. I'm, they're no longer going to come through my property with drugs, period. And this little Mexican spotter was up against the window, and his eyes were like, you know, the deer in the headlights. They all understand English. So they processed him back into Mexico, and about two weeks later, some guys came over to the house, and they were plain clothes, Border Patrol, Intel, and said, watch your back, they put a $20,000 bounty on you. Now, I had ordered an FNFAL, which looks like those G3s, only it's a semi-automatic, not a, those are actually assault weapons, they're machine guns. They've got semi and full automatic fire. I figured if, if it looked like theirs, they'd think I had something they had. Well, the first Bush had just signed the assault weapon ban. Now, an assault weapon is actually a machine gun. An AR-15 and an AR-10 are not assault weapons because they don't fire full automatic. The communists in our government want to ban them, so they call them assault weapons. Anyway, so the company I had ordered this from, uh, I kept bugging them and bugging them. I had a gun store in Alpine at the time, and they said, we can't get the guns because even though we had bought them, paid for them, Prior to the enactment of this law, Customs is holding them and it won't let us have it, so we're having to sue the government to get them. This may take a long time. So how about we send you another rifle that shoots 308, the same thing? Okay, so they sent me a match grade M14, which the military has used for a long time. And then one day I was walking down, going for a walk, and I walked down there towards the border. That was before my fence and before the steel fence. But after they put the bounty on me and a couple of guys were walking up, they thought the ag fence was the border. The border was 60 feet south on the south end of the Roosevelt easement because Theodore Roosevelt, when he was president, took 60 feet off everybody's property from Brownsville to the Pacific Ocean. The Department of Agriculture put a fence up 60 feet in then in the treaty, the Mexicans were going to put a fence up on the border. They haven't done it yet. It's only been 100 years, so, you know. There was a guy with a rifle and a guy with a gallon jug of water walking up there, and my dogs were run, run down there barking at him. They spotted the dogs, and then the guy with a water bottle spotted me, and the guy takes a rifle down. He missed me by about two feet. So I pulled my M14 out from behind me and blew the water bottle out of the kid's hand. My first round's always a hollow point. So when that hits a bottle of water, it just explodes. And I've not been shot at from Mexico since. I've had several people with guns that I've encountered, and they know what I look like. So they'd be sitting there with a rifle, and then they go, oh, and turn around and walk off. But like I said, it's, it's been interesting living here. After talking with Bob, we got back on the road, headed on the final stretch back to Texas so I could fly home. 